it's 11 a.m. That is being recorded. That is also. Okay, so all set. And, of course, uh, you can hear me. If suddenly I disappear <laughs> acoustically, or, right, let me know. Um, okay, so uh, let's try to understand again where we are and where are we going. You remember, in the first lecture, we introduced the foundation. Like in any theoretical course, you need to lay down the foundation, and based on that foundation, the whole castle of the theoretical course can be built. Right. So, and then as a first point where we moved uh, from that foundation, we started looking at a multi-particle system. Right. And we saw the beauty of the Newton's third law. Then, okay, now at that point, we knew how to treat a multi-particle system, and we applied those results for a rocket, right? So we derived a rocket equation. Basically, it's just an example application of those results, right? We just applied results for a multi-particle system to one of the multi-particle systems. All right, all right. So we started diving into this multi-particle system. Uh, and now, as a result, we decided, let's play with multi-particle system uh, in an attempt maybe to find something, something interesting, something useful, which can simplify analysis of a multi-particle system. Of course, analysis, it means um, uh, to describe its motion, to predict its future, right? You remember the goal of classical mechanics is uh, to be like a fortune teller, to tell uh, the future about the system, where it is going to be and what it is going to do, right? So, now, in an attempt to find something interesting, useful, to simplify, our, to simplify our life in description of the motion, so we decided, let's assume that we have a multi-particle system. On purpose, I didn't write the title. I will write it in a, uh, five, ten minutes, right? Multi-particle system, we, we discussed that in the previous class, so as a result, I <coughs> prepared it. So, you see black dots, multi-particle system, there are N of them, N capital. And I use uh, index alpha to label them, right? And then I picked a completely random arbitrary particle, m alpha, out of the system, right? Position of that particle can be defined by position vector r sub alpha, right? Then, okay, just for fun, no reason whatsoever, I decided, and I told you, okay, guys, let's take a completely arbitrary point in space, not a point in the system, right, of these particles. No, it's just a point in space, somewhere between the particles, right? And I call it C for now, right? And, of course, position of that point can be defined by a position vector R sub C. And, of course, I picked uh, a reference frame to describe the system. And of course, a reference frame is inertial, right? So let me emphasize on that. So, inertial RF. <clears throat> okay, so now uh, we can define position of the particle relative to uh, the origin, to the center of the world, right, of this inertial reference frame. And also we can introduce the uh, <clears throat> a vector which defines position of this particle alpha relative to that point C. Again, just for no reason. So, let's just <laughs> um, play with that. And, of course, now we have a triangle of vectors, so I can write an equation, vector equation. So, R alpha equals RC plus RC alpha. That's where we stopped in the previous class. And now, let's start from here. Okay, now let me <coughs> multiply both sides by the mass of the particle. So, of course, I will have M. Okay, let me write uh, 2M alpha R alpha. Plus, I will leave some space over here on purpose. Um, M alpha RC, right? And then plus, and again, I will leave some space. Uh, M alpha RC alpha. Okay, so I can write that for this particle alpha. And of course, there are n particles like that. So I can write an equation like this for each of these particles. And, of course, I'm going to end up with n equations. Okay? Then I can add them all up. Again, just for fun. Right? So far, no reasons whatsoever. Right? 
We're just wandering around hope, hoping to get something useful. Okay, so I can add them up, all these equations. So I can sum over the whole system from 1 to n, from 1 to n, and here summation over alpha from 1 to n. Okay, so I got something which looks uh, decently crazy. Oh, strange. And, of course, now, so what can be done with this, right? Um, first of all, since point C was picked in the completely, it's a completely arbitrary point C. We, we have not imposed any restrictions, nothing, no uh, constraints of particle on point, not particle, sorry, point, point in space, point C, right? So we can move it anywhere we want by looking at this equation. So we can move point C over here and see what will, what will happen to this equation. I can pull, move point C over here and see what happens to this equation. So let's move point C to such a point, to such a place, so that, for example, this term would be zero. Okay, just in attempt to simplify this equation, right? So again, why not? We can find, we should be able to find a point like this, right? So let me, <clears throat> since C is arbitrary, let's move it, let's move it uh, to a place, all right, so that this thing, the last term, so that summation over alpha from 1 to n, m alpha r c alpha equals to zero. Okay, now I'm imposing. Okay, so I want now to pick a particular spot in the system. I will position point C over there, and I demand that this will be equal zero at that point. So for any system, I should be able to find the spot like this. Okay, so now <clears throat> let me frame it, All right? Let me frame it. Uh, and, and what will be left from the equation. Okay, now let me call this point R sub C because it's exactly the same for all points. It doesn't, it, it is not affected by this summation, right? So this summation is basically like a isolated from that. So, right? So R C is exactly the same, so it's not involved in that summation, right? So now uh, let me, <coughs> uh, let's denote R sub C as R capital, just for fun, right? And now what will be left in this equation, let me even show that this will be zero, right? So this is zero, and as a result, we're getting uh, that R, this is just the total mass, right? Which way I wrote it, total mass, so it will be, as a result, it will be summation M alpha R alpha equals to M uh, okay, R capital I decided to use, right? So now I can rewrite it. R equals uh, summation over the whole system from 1 to n. M alpha R alpha divided by the total mass of the system. And of course now you can see what we got. We got the center of mass point which we can call the center of mass. Okay, of course, I will frame it. <coughs> right. And now we have this first and this is second. Let me label it like this. Right. And now I can write actually the title, the center of mass. Right. So now I can write center of mass. Right. And uh, now, you know what, before I start discussing <coughs> um, this and that, let me... Okay, I will, I will do it that later. <coughs> now, let's see. Basically, uh, this can be used as a definition of center of mass, because then it will lead immediately to this. Or this can be used as a definition of center of mass, and then, of course, it will lead to that. So, uh, this two, uh, both this and that can be used as a definition of center of mass. Then why 
usually this equation is used as a definition. If you open any book, usually it's, they start immediately from this. Okay, uh, this is the equation which can be used, a formula which can be used to this, uh, which can be used to find a point of center of mass. How come? Why? And now let's look at this equation first, and then at that in terms of um, as, a de as, as a definition. At this equation, let's first look. <coughs> All right, I will probably use over here underneath. All right, so equation number one is a definition. Let me look at four points, for example, right? Let's say this is point one, and this is point two. Here will be maybe three, uh, here four, right? So just four points. And of course, uh, center of mass will be somewhere we know will be in the middle, right? Somewhere over here, right? Maybe I used, I used the red. And what do we have here? It's a mass, for example, m1 times what is rc alpha? It's a vector which defines position of the mass relative to center of mass point, right? This is rc alpha. It's a position of the mass relative to the point, center of mass point. Okay, so what we have here? Mass m1 times this uh, vector, right? Then uh, the second mass times the vector then the third mass times this vector, then the fourth one, right? And if you uh, take these products and add them all up, you're going to end up with zero. Okay, so this is basically, the center of mass is sort of like a point of equilibrium, right? So you can balance the whole system uh, relative to that point. Balance these <clears throat> products, m times r, m times r, r, where r is the distance uh, from the center of mass to the point. Sort of like a um, point relative to which the system can be balanced, right? <laughs> okay, so from this uh, definition, I can see the meaning of the center of mass. Again, it's some, some special sweet spot relative to which the system can be balanced. Right? This balanced MR, MRs, MRs. But, okay, so I can see the meaning, but what about, um, let's look at this equation from the practical point of view. Again, what do I mean from practical? The formula or equation which can be used to find the position of the center of mass because that's what we need most of the time. And by looking at this definition, I'm not getting... Um, uh, uh, we cannot find position of the center of mass because, because you actually need to know the center of mass position in order to write, uh, write RC alpha, right? So. Uh, you, you need to know the center of mass in order to write this equation, which, uh, which can be used as the definition of center of mass. So pretty much we try to find unknown with the help of another unknown, which is not good at all. So my point, this equation is better in terms of understanding the meaning, physical meaning, no, philosophical meaning of the center of mass but it's useless in terms of finding position of the center of mass. What about now this equation? This equation, uh, m times r, all these r's defines, uh, all these r's define position of particles relative to our inertial reference frame where you, uh, uh, position of which you know, you pick that reference frame, right? So, and uh, pretty much, usually, you know position of all particles, right? Because you're trying to describe that system, you know where the particles are, you know where, this, where the reference frame is, so usually these are alphas unknown, and of course, mass is unknown, right? As a result, this is, from the practical point of view, it's, yeah, it's nice, it allows us to find position of the center of mass easily. But, uh, in terms of understanding what is the center of mass, by looking at this equation, for me, it's not clear. If I didn't have this, by looking at that, it's so, what is this? Mass times position of, this, of the mass relative to the origin divided by the total mass, right? The meaning of the center of mass from this is not clear, at least for me. Maybe for you it is, uh, you can see that, right? But for me, it's not. So from a point of view of understanding of the center of mass, this is better, but, not, but this is not practical. 
But from the practical point of view, this is better, but it's difficult to see the meaning of the center of mass by looking at this equation. So basically, but of course, um, people who are in research in physics engineering, of course, they are very, very practical, sometimes can be even pragmatic, right? Okay, so of course, they use this equation uh, to define the center of mass, although nothing wrong with that. Because if you uh, define this, this follows immediately. If you define this, that follows immediately, right? So uh, that's why all the books uses this equation to define the center of mass. And, and again, usually books, they just give this equation, this formula. Okay, so here the center of mass, use it, enjoy it. But in one of the books, I don't remember which one, when I, I saw this introduction, I, I like it a lot. So you just pick a random point and then find the sweet spot for the mass in order to for simplify this equation. And then as a result, center of mass appears naturally. I like this introduction, right? So then I adopted it and I'm not planning to skip it. Right. Okay. Uh, and, and, and uh, sometimes this equation quite it can be useful, right, when you try to describe the system, right, especially if uh, relative to the center of mass. And, and another equation can be useful, right, uh, if you differentiate this equation with respect to time, you will get summation over alpha from 1 to n, m alpha v c alpha, right. So basically, these are velocities of particles relative to the, relative to the center of mass point. Again, this can be sometimes useful for some problems, right? Not this, but that. Right. Let me frame it. Right. I don't remember, but I think, I think at some point um, in the homework, or no, either, I don't remember, is it undergraduate or graduate level course, we use that in some derivations, right? But anyway, you've seen in the physics one, uh, and you use equations like this. Right? So we define the center of mass, but we still, it's some kind of, okay, cool, interesting point, but so, so what a big deal, right? So far, we didn't see the beauty and advantage of having the center of mass point, right? And we will postpone that till probably the end of the class. Now, we need to uh, look at... Um, for example, right now it was introduced for a discrete set of particles. What about rigid object? We will do that. We will look at the example, right? And before we go into that, uh, let me give you one trick which can be used to find center of mass over a reasonably complicated object, which consists of uh, symmetrical parts. If you put all the parts together, the object can be very asymmetrical. But Parts are symmetrical, so uh, there is a inter useful trick, trick which can be used to find the center of mass of objects like that. All right, so uh, I will now look at that, and this example I will skip. I used to solve one problem which allows us to, to prove that if you have two point masses, that the center of mass lies on the line connecting them. All right, so, but at some point I decided to skip that example. Right, so we'll skip it. And now, let me just label it a trick to find the center of mass. All right, so a trick to find... Okay, of course, I'm going to abbreviate as CM. Some people abbreviate as COM, but I'm lazy to add O in the middle, right? So center of mass, CM. No, come on, we're all lazy, right? Especially if you have to write it every, okay, not every day, but every class. Right. Right. <clears throat> all right, so the trick is this. Maybe I will uh, draw, uh, draw it and explain it. So let's assume that you have some complicated system. It can be a rigid object or, or can be just a set of uh, point masses. And of course, um, if you want to define position of the center of mass, you need to introduce the reference frame, right? You need to measure it relative uh, to something, right? So let's assume that this is our reference frame, right? It doesn't have to be inertial right now because we're just trying to define the point in space, right? All right, and, and 
All right, so we need to find the center of mass eventually, the center of mass of this object, right? So the trick is you can divide this object into two parts. Let's say I divide it like this. You can define, you can divide it in any way. And let's assume that you can, that you know position of the center of mass of this subsystem. That is center of mass of the first sub subsystem. And let's say the mass of the first subsystem is M1. And again, as I said, you, let's assume that you know that point, the center of mass of that subsystem. So uh, this R1, let's assume that again, you can easily find it. And then of course we can do the same with the second one. Okay, let me use I know, green, All right? So now it will be CM of the second subsystem and the total mass of the second subsystem is M2. And of course, uh, position vector R2. Okay, let's assume that we can do that. And now you can easily, you should be able to find the center of mass of the whole system easily. And in order to do that, you need to do this. All right, so now, okay, no, let me keep the colors the same. <clears throat> So the same reference frame. So now what you do? You take the total mass of the whole of this of the first subsystem and position it at the center of mass. Basically like a squeezing the whole first subsystem at the point, the center of mass point. All right, so that was blue. All right, so let me create this fake particle with mass M1 position at the center of mass. So that is R1. Then let's do the same with the second subsystem. So basically you grab the whole system, subsystem 2 and squeeze it in the uh, point uh, position at the center of mass uh, 2. Right? So it should be here somewhere, right? So that's M2 and position at R2. And now you have basically two-point masses and you just apply the formula for two-point masses to find the center of mass and the center of mass of these two points will be the center of mass of the whole system there will be a problem in your homework where you uh, where you should use that uh, trick right. okay so now so then the center of mass will be somewhere of course on the line connecting two-point masses that's the example which I decided to skip to where I would I prove that center of mass of two-point masses lies on the line connecting them. So this will be CM R capital, right? So, and now, as I said, uh, now you can use the formula for two-point masses. So M1 R1 plus M2 uh, R2 divided by m1 plus m2 so that is that is the center of mass of the whole system right so that will be somewhere over here that center of mass example example obvious example all right um, uh, a mullet okay i forgot is it yeah double l all right, so if you have, uh, let's say, the handle of a mullet, then the head, right? Okay, reasonably complicated system. And if somebody asks you, uh, where is the center of mass of the whole system? Kind of, okay, I don't know exactly. I can roughly <laughs> give you a, uh, but using this trick, you can easily find the center of mass, all right? So, you separate like this. This is your first subsystem, and it's basically a rectangle. Not basically, it is a rectangle. We can easily find the center of mass of a rectangle. So the center of mass will be somewhere here. Right? Center of mass at 1, CM1. And let's, you can do exactly the same with the, with the head, because it's also just a rectangle. Right, so the center of mass will be over here somewhere, CM2. Okay, so now we have uh, point mass with the total mass of the handle over here, 
point mass with the total mass of the second uh, subsystem over there. And again, use the formula for the center of mass of two-point masses. And of course, you can subdivide um, into more than two subsystems. You can subdivide it into three, four, right? So there are no limits. I used to prove it, this trick. Uh, and then last year, I decided, okay, no, I will skip proof. I will ask you to prove it, but, but I will show the proof. So basically what you need, you just need to read it by yourself, right? And then reproduce it by yourself, right? So I just want to save time, but at the same time, I will give you a solution, right? I started practicing, practicing that in the previous semester in the graduate level classical mechanics course. And the kind of, okay, I, so far I like it. Right. So as a result, I will skip the proof and it will be in your homework. And I, of course, I will provide the proof. Um, proof. Uh, will be your homework, right? Okay. All right. Uh, in in your homework, there will be a uh, circular disk, mass density, uh, uniform, uh, yeah, uniform mass density, mass distribution, uh, and there will be circular hole. All right. Uh, use this trick. Don't be afraid to introduce negative mass. Because basically, what is a hole? The hole is equal amount of positive mass and negative mass from the mathematical point of view, and that will give you a hole. I remember that's uh, when I was an undergrad student, right? Uh, I remember we had a problem how to find the electric field uh, outside of the sphere with a spherical hole. And I remember there was a hint at the end of the book, right? Among the answers, there was a hint. Fill up the hole with positive and negative charges. And we're all sitting in, what, what, how does it help, right? So what's so, and I remember I was sitting just without understanding, just drawing pluses and minuses, pluses and minuses. And then suddenly I realized, damn it, it's so if you fill with pluses and minuses, it will be just basically a hole, right? No charges. And then of course, finding the electric field outside would just piece of cake, trivial, right? So exactly the same can be used here if you fill the hole with, uh, positive mass and negative mass. Of course, negative mass doesn't exist, but from the mathematical point of view, who cares, right? If something exists or not. All right, okay. And again, we still don't see the beauty of the center of mass. We just uh, introduce a trick which can be used to find the center of mass, right? And so the next, uh, let's look at the rigid object. How can, we, how can we find the center of mass of the rigid object? So we're still not going to look at why do we need this point? What's so special about this center of mass point? All right, so now let me uh, sort of quickly make a transition from here to the rigid object and, and then we will look at one example. Again, in your homework, there will be an example. All right, so now, I will put a new big bullet, and now center of mass of a rigid object. Center of mass of a rigid object. Again, rigid object is just a multi-particle system with uh, rigid connections between particles, right? Otherwise, it's just a normal rigid object. All right, okay, so let's just... Um, Imagine that we have some ar completely arbitrary solid object, rigid object. Of course, we need to introduce the reference frame, coordinate system, I don't x, y, z. And of course, since definition was done for point masses, of course, we need to create a fake point masses. So we need to slide the object into small pieces, right? Chop it into small pieces, right? in all directions, in all three directions, or two directions if it's a, a two-dimensional object. So let me slice it. And let's take one of these boxes, patches, right? So let's say I will take this one, which has a mass of delta m alpha, so let's say, let me call it delta m alpha. So it's basically box number alpha. Of course, position vector, 
uh, which we label it r alpha, r small, r alpha, right? And of course now, so now we have uh, I know, n n point masses, so these patches are small or boxes are small. So we can treat them as point masses and we can use the definition of the center of mass because that definition is usually uh, presented for point masses, right? For a point mass or for a system of point masses, right? So now I can write that, of course, in this case, R will be approximately equal. Yeah, probably I should write it in a vector form. So we need to sum over, we not M alpha, delta M alpha, delta M alpha, so mass times position vector R alpha, right? Of course, over the whole system from 1 to n and divided by the total mass. Right? So it will be summation again over alpha of delta M alpha. Right? So it's approximately equal because, yeah, so far those delta M's are not exactly point masses, but we will need to take the limit. Now let's uh, make a transition to density. Delta M alpha, of course, it is density at that particular point times the volume. Right. Okay, so of course we can plug it here, take the limit, and we will get the integrals. So R uh, will be equal. So now I will take limit uh, when N goes to infinity or delta V goes to zero, right? Which is basically the same. And this, so summation, of course, separately limit for the denominator and separately limit for the numerator. Uh, delta, oh, no, no, let me start with rho. Rho at r alpha. Uh, then what else? Ah, let me write first r, r alpha and then delta v sub alpha. Right, and then divided by a numerator, I mean denominator, but without R summation of rho. All right, delta V alpha, right. And of course, when you take the limit, numerator give you a, okay, double or triple integral, it depends on the, uh, how many dimensions you have. So you will end up a triple integral of rho R dv and divided by the triple, again, or double integral, depends on how many uh, dimensions you have. Uh, that will be rho dv, which is the total mass. Right. So that's uh, basically now a formula adopted, adjusted for a rigid object, for a solid object. Right. And again, we're just playing with the definition, but still we haven't justified that there is any sense of uh, using the center of mass. But of course we know that um, it's a ridiculously useful point. And that's why it goes almost the very beginning, right after introducing multiparticle system. Okay, now I need to start erasing something. I guess now I will need some space because now I will look at the example, right? right. Um, and of course, there will be an example in your homework just to practice uh, uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional integration, right? just to refresh. Ah, uh, no, before that, before that. Okay, now I just realized. Uh, now we need to refresh. How can we make a transition? in triple or double integrals from, if it's, for example, written first in Cartesian coordinates, how can we move to spherical or cylindrical coordinates, right? You remember the Jacobian of transformation, right? Uh, so now let's recall that. And I guess, okay, I have no options. I have to erase this part anyway. <clears throat> so now let's quickly refresh those transitions. And, and then uh, example, and only then we will look at the example. 
Right, so, um, so let's refresh transitions. Let's refresh. Okay, I'm not going to write transitions. So let's assume that you have an integral, triple integral, some function f, which first written in the Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z. And of course, uh, let's assume it's a volume integral. So it's a dx, dy, dz. So it's basically this dv written in Cartesian coordinates, right? Now, how can we make a transition to, for example, spherical coordinates? Right. Of course, it will be triple integral still, right? Again, so volume over the whole volume, right? Uh, of course, you need to rewrite function in terms of r, uh, phi, and theta, right? It depends on the function. You can easily make it that uh, transformation. And now, of course, here should be dv, but now, of course, dv in spherical coordinates uh, looks more complicated than this, right? Because now we're going to have a Jacobian of transformation. And Jacobian of transformation from Cartesian to cylindrical, it's a r squared sine theta. And only then we can write dr, d theta, d phi. Right. dr, d theta, d phi. So this stuff is a Jacobian j. Right. You can find that Jacobian using two ways. Either write a uh, determinant, determinant, which is consist of what? Uh, the first row, it's a dx over dr, partial derivative. Then partial derivative of x with respect to theta. Then dx over d phi, that will be the first row. The second will be dx, no, dy over dr. Then dy over d theta, dy over d phi, that will be the second row. And the last one, of course, will be dz over dr, dz over d theta, dz over d phi. Once you write that down, open it up, you will end up with this. But it's, uh, it's, it's probably the most, uh, the longest and the most ridiculous way of finding the Jacobian, right? Of course, there is an easier way, graphical. And Dr. Egan, in his EMAC class at the very beginning, he drew nice pictures, right, very nicely. <clears throat> Right. It's like recently, uh, I saw one guy who graduated from, with PhD from this school, right? And so he, he asked, so how is, uh, how is department? And the first question was, is Dr. Egan still teaching? He said, it's, it's the, uh, the only sweet, sweet moment of sweet classes, <laughs> which he experienced, right? <clears throat> so students remember Dr. Egan, right? All right, so... Uh, Let's, uh, let's just get it graphically quickly. All right, so Jacobian. Right. So let me draw coordinate system again. First start with Cartesian. And now let's do this. Right, and draw something like this. Right. Basically, okay, let me also draw here and here. It's a cube, uh, infinitesimally small cube, dv, dv, right? So this dv drawn in spherical coordinates. So now let's just write uh, the volume. Since every, all the sides are small, infinitesimally small, so we'll just take this times this times that. Okay, so let me uh, uh, write for uh, the expressions for those sides, and then, of course, we will get what we have here. Okay, so first, uh, this side, obviously, it's just dr. Then, uh, this angle is uh, theta, then as a result, this angle is d theta, right? So this is theta, measured this way. And, of course, as a result, this is r, and then this will be r d theta. Okay, so let me draw this over here. So this will be r d theta. Now we still have that side, sort of in depth. All right, so that side, in order to see that side, let me draw 
let me project it uh, over here so we will have this picture and the site which we are talking about is this right which we need to find to that so this length is the angle first of all this is phi this angle is d phi this side is r sine theta r sine theta as a result this side this side which is also here here right it will be r sine theta d phi r sine theta d phi so now once you multiply all these three sides you will get the volume and you will get this this whole structure so they will be jacobian plus the r d phi d theta of course uh, in this case dv equals so dr r sine theta and r sine theta d phi right no, 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 something, something, something is fish. No, 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 no. Ah, yeah, I just, uh, sorry. Uh, R d theta. Okay. D theta. This side, right. I just wrote that uh, twice. <clears throat> right. Of course, we're getting, uh, and of course, this is the easiest way. So it will be r squared sine theta dr d phi d theta. In similar, we can uh, write down the transition from Cartesian, integral written in Cartesian coordinates, to, co to uh, for example, cylindrical coordinates. So let me put here the first bullet. It's uh, from Cartesian to spherical. And now the second bullet will be from Cartesian to cylindrical. So again, triple integral, uh, f, x, y, z, dx, dy, dz equals, again, triple. Again, function must be rewritten, of course. It will be f of r, uh, which phi or theta I use, just a second. Phi, okay. Uh, phi, z, and then Jacobian is just r. Right. Again, now this r, it's a, uh, r in polar coordinates, right? So, it's, of course, it's different from this r. This is r in spherical coordinates. So, it will be r, dr, d phi, dz. So, now Jacobian is just r. Again, you can get it using that crazy determinant, All right? But of course, it's much easier to get it graphically. All right. <clears throat> okay, uh, it will be difficult to to draw it here. Although, let me try. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, this, 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 and now. We need to again draw dv, but now in cylindrical. Right, so this is easier. So I should draw something like this. Right. Then drop down. Right. And of course, we can project it on the. Uh, no, I don't need this, this line, right. right, something like this. Ah, no, now I do need that line. Okay, so now I can connect it. Okay, so now again, we just need to write all the sides. So this will be uh, dz, this is z, x, y. Uh, then this angle is, uh, of course, d phi, angle d phi. So as a result, this side, okay, this side is dz, this side will be r d phi, <coughs> r 
d phi and then ah, of course this side as well this side will be just dr right so again dv just multiply three sides and of course you will get this construction <coughs> so it will be dv equals r dr d phi dz right. again dr egan spent more time right drawing nice uh, pictures right so now after refreshing this jacobian of transformation now let's look at the example and a rigid object or solid object uh, will be a cone. Right? So radius of the foundation is given, or base, and the height is given also. Okay, I need this uh, formula, so let me just keep it for a second. <clears throat> and then I will erase it. So let me start with the picture. Actually, it's example 3.2. Okay, why not? So example. So picture. You know what? I will probably... No, it doesn't matter. Again, right-handed system, although here it's not a big deal. X, Y, Z. And now the cone itself. Right, so. right. so, solid, rigid, so it's not just a surface, it's a solid cone. So this point, the height is given, H small. And radius is r. So what is given? So we have a cone, height h, radius r, radius of the uh, base. Right. Um, no, nothing else is given. Right. So we just need to uh, apply this formula. Right. And I will write so R equals, okay, mass, the total mass of the cone, I'm not going to integrate because integration will be very similar to what we're going to do in the denominator. So I will just use high school knowledge and at the end I will uh, write down mass. But for now, let's just keep M. And so integral, okay, it's a volume integral, of course. Uh, rho, ah, uh, yeah, and let's assume that mass density, distribution of mass is uniform. So rho is constant. Right. Rho is constant. Again, rho is not given, but we know it's constant. So rho r d v. Right. And of course, what is this dv and rho? It's somewhere over here, right? At some arbitrary height. Uh, z, right? I will pick. I will pick some uh, small box or small cube, right? For my integration, which has a volume dv or mass dm, right? Okay, let me write mass dm, dm, right? And I'm going to uh, integrate, add all these dms over the whole uh, volume, right? But Obviously, Cartesian coordinate probably is not the best over here to use to integrate. But, uh, of course, you can use spherical or um, cylindrical. But let's switch in a few minutes to different coordinates. Let me first open this up explicitly in Cartesian coordinates in order to, to make first simplifications. And only then we'll, we'll make a transition using these transformations. Right? Okay, so... So R, we can write, of course, in Cartesian coordinates. So it will be 1 over M integral, which we wrote it. Oh, yeah, just like this. 
So uh, I had x. Um, ah, yeah, rho can be also taken outside. Let me take rho outside because it is a, it's a constant. So rho is outside. You see, this is rho. Then I x uh, plus y j hat plus z k hat, right? And then dv, which is, of course, um, yeah, let me write it, open it up explicitly in the next line. dv, of course, dx divided z. Okay, now let's look at the x component. X coordinate, x coordinate of the center of mass, not component, x coordinate. Right, which way I wrote it? I just started a new line. Okay, I had uh, integral x dv. This constant, forget about them for now. x uh, dv, of course, I can write it as integral of x dx dy dz, right? Ah, I had. In front, I had. Okay, and now let. Of course, it's a triple integral, so let me uh, separate these integrals. All right, so it will be I had. First, I will write, I know, dz, then dy, and then integral of x dx. And of course, in the last one, I will write the limits. Integration, of course, in the x direction, it will be from uh, minus r over there to r. So there are no any choices from minus r to r because the radius of the base is r. Right. And what will be the value of this integral? What will be the answer? You don't need even to calculate or do anything because according to the calculus, you remember if you integrate odd function and x is an odd function, right? Over symmetrical limits, it's zero. Right, you remember you, you discussed that I'm sure that in somewhere in calculus or math analysis, right? So this is zero. And of course, let me tell you, right? So it's an integral of an odd function over symmetrical limits. It's a well-known fact from calculus, right? So integral of an odd function over symmetrical limits. Zero. And exactly the same story will be in the y, about the y component. Right. Not component, coordinate, y coordinate. Right, so similar. So j hat over, again, let me write immediately this. So it will be dz dx, an integral of y dy, and again from r to r. And again, integration over y is going to give you zero, right? Again, this is zero. So basically, in order to dump x coordinate and y coordinate, in order to show that they are zero, I did that in Cartesian coordinates. And now, after simplifying, in order to calculate z coordinate, I, I will move to most likely cylindrical coordinates. Right. Okay, so now I don't need this uh, definition. Right. So now what's left? Let me rewrite it. So now R equals um, rho over m, rho over m. Then now I can take k hat outside because this is zero, this is zero, so only the last term leave. survives. K okay, hat and integral of uh, z dv and now, yeah, now it makes sense to make a transition to a much more convenient coordinate system. Right. And I think I use cylindrical, let me check. Yeah, cylindrical coordinate. Right, so So let's move to cylindrical coordinates. So Jacobian is just R, so we'll have this instead of dv. 
So let me write it here. So k hat rho over m integral of, no, I'm afraid that I will not be able to fit it in that side. So r equals, so it will be k hat rho over m and integral of z r dr r dr uh, d phi and dz. Okay, so now of course we need to write explicitly all three integrals and um, probably I will write integral over the first as the last uh, as the first one and then uh, integral over r and then integral over z. So it will be k hat rho over m and the last one will be over z. So there are two z's, z dz. z dz. The last integral, okay, I will put the limits uh, at, the, at the last moment. Then integral over r, r dr and then integration over phi. Okay, now let's take care of the limits. Over phi, no troubles, just from 0 to 2 pi. Integration over r, okay, r and z are connected because the uh, maximum uh, value, the upper limit of r depends on z, right? So if we are at this level, our maximum is that. If we move higher, of course, our max, uh, upper limit of R increases. So R and Z are connected. So we need to express that connection over here, right? that the relation, that those relations over here. People outside are cleaning the corridor <laughs> vacuum. <laughs> I hope you're not here. You don't hear that. You're not hearing that. <clears throat> Right, uh, so uh, the lower limit in R, no questions, every time it starts from zero. But the uh, upper limit, it's at this, right? So let me show that this is R upper limit, right? So uh, in order to find that, we can use properties over similar triangles. Because what, which similar triangles? Look, this point, that point, and that point. This triangle, it's a right triangle, right? And it is similar to this triangle, the large one. This point, that point, that point. Because the angles are the same, right? If angles of two triangles are the same, they are similar, right? So we can use the ratio. This side versus that side equals to this side versus that side, right? So we can use uh, that. Let me open my explanation box and write down that similar triangles use similar triangles. I'm running out of space, so it's just a sign of a triangle. Use similar triangles. So it's a ratio of R upper limit. R upper limit versus R capital. R capital, it's a side, corresponding side of a big triangle. Equals to the ratio of these sides along Z direction. So it will be z small over h small. z small over h small. As a result, we can get the upper limit for r. It's uh, z times r capital divided by h. Let me check if I'm getting the same. Yeah, yeah, so we're good. Right, so let me close my explanation box and I can write over here this upper limit. So it will be r times z over h r, z over h, yeah, upper limit. Right. And of course, the last integral must have definite limits, no functions, right? Because at that moment, we need to close the whole, all this mass. So z integrate, of course, from 0 to h. From 0 to, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> from 0 to h. Right. Okay, so now, we just need to we just need to integrate them carefully. Okay, now I can erase this.
Okay, 2 pi trivial. So R uh, equals k hat rho over m and 2 pi, of course, I will factor out immediately this 2 pi, right? Then uh, integral of that, it will be R squared over 2. Okay, let me write first integral over z. z dz from 0 to h and this will be r squared over 2, the lower limit is going to, okay, let me write carefully. So it will be uh, r squared over 2, let me take 1 over, factor 1 over 2 outside. So it will be 1 over 2, and then uh, r squared, it will be upper limit, r z over h, and that is squared minus 0 squared, right? Because sometimes we're in here, I start uh, skipping steps and students kind of, damn it, what, what you've done over here, what you've done over there, right? So. <clears throat> okay, two goes, right? And as a result, we're getting uh, r squared over h squared, again, we'll be taking out, outside of the integral, so it will be rho r squared over m h squared, right? So that, and z squared stays, of course, inside of the last integral. So we have z to the power of 3. Okay, let me rewrite it one more time. So it's a from 0 to h, uh, z to the power of 3 dz. Right. Okay, so now again, it's trivial integral. Uh, z to the power of 4 over 4. So it will be k rho r squared over m h squared, and then, of course, z to the power of 4 over 4, and from 0 to h. Because I remember when I start skipping steps, again, students kind of start uh, losing, start losing me, at least. Uh, we had that in the past. I had that in the past. Okay, so almost done. Except, of course, we will take care of the, we will have to take care of the mass. So, k rho r squared h to the power of 4, then divided by 4 m h squared. Okay, I hope I haven't lost anything. So, this will be cancelled to 2, reduced, and this will be cancelled. So, now mass, of course, mass, I'm not going to do integration, although it can be easily done, very similar. All right. I will just use the uh, volume of a cone from high school, right? So it will be rho times volume, the total volume, right? So it will be rho times 1 over 3. Uh, the base is pi r squared times the height is h, right? So I'll just use the high school stuff. So we'll plug it over here, uh, and that will be the final push. K hat rho r squared h to the power of 2, 4. And now mass. Right? I just rewrote, and now it's time to write mass. So uh, rho pi r squared h will be downstairs, rho pi r squared h, and 3, of course, goes upstairs. And well, tons of cancellations. r to the power of 2 goes. 1 h goes. Uh, pi stays. Rho goes. Yeah, pi. No, pi shouldn't stay. Where is pi? Ah, yeah, I lost pi. What I was afraid of, right? So sometimes I lose something. Okay, this I cancel too, but pi and then pi disappeared because that pi and this pi should also cancel each other. Okay, sorry. Okay, let me use different color to emphasize where is that. So p, I mean pi, then uh, pi here, right, and then pi there, right? Okay, so now this pi. And that pi can be also cancelled. And we have something which has units of length, which is good, right? 
Uh, so it will be k hat, so it's a k uh, z coordinate, so 3 over 4 uh, h. Okay. So as a result, coordinates of center of mass 0, 0, 3 over 4 h. And again, in your homework, there will be something similar. And again, very often students just start jumping over steps. As a result, they something and not getting, uh, not matching. They started fudging. Right? <laughs> As a result, it's a mess. Right? No, carefully. Sometimes it's useful to stay on co in Cartesian coordinates to dump something, right, uh, with justifying, and only then to make a transition uh, to a convenient coordinates. Right? Of course, you can say it's obviously right uh, because of the symmetry that the x component, uh, x coordinate and y coordinate must be zero. But that's sort of conceptually right here. It's introduction into theoretical course. Everything must be more or less derived. Right? <clears throat> so it's better to show mathematically that those coordinates are zero. Whew. So up to this point, pretty much the whole class, we've just discussing. Uh, We've been discussing how to find the center of mass, right? Again, we still don't know what's the what's the fuss. Does it make sense to spend so much to, so much time uh, discussing this um, center of mass point? So now it's time to see all beauties of center of mass, all simplifications, all amazing properties of center of mass point. Right? Again, if you want to describe a multiparticle system, okay. So now, yeah, we would be able to see all the beauties. Well, we'll share it with the next class. Okay, I guess I will start erasing this part. I guess my neighbor soon will become an expert in physics, right? So since uh, uh, it's easy to hear what happens <laughs> next door, right? And since I lecture here every day, two or three classes, right? I don't know how they handle this. <clears throat> okay, so now let's see the beauties of center of mass. Centers, let me even just label that, I mean write it so beauties of are uh, having center of mass, right? You can label anywhere you want. Of course, it, it, there is a um, sort of sophisticated name, right? But I don't want to use it for now. Okay, so now we have a definition of center of mass. And of course, if we want to see any beauties, any advantages or any amazing properties, of course, we must start from there, from the definition. Okay, let's start from the definition. All right. And definition, of course, R equals, so which we wrote it with M. Okay, one M capital. M and then summation over the whole system from one to N, uh, M alpha, R alpha. All right, so that's definition. And of course, the next uh, logical step, so okay, we have definition, but what about dynamics of this thing? of the center of mass, right? So what happens uh, with this R in time? So let's just differentiate with respect to time to see dynamics, right? So it will be R dot. And again, most of the time R dot, it's a derivative with respect to time, except in the graduate level course in one chapter, Goldstein used dot to denote some other derivatives, right? But most of the time it's a derivative with respect to time. So Look at dyna dynamics. Look at dynamics. Right, of course, mass stays, and then summation over the whole system, m alpha, r alpha, dot. And again, we assume the point masses, so mass of point masses cannot be changed. Yeah, they basically are sort of like a mathematically elementary particles. All right, and of course, obviously, that is 
m alpha r alpha, it's a linear momentum of particle alpha. Hmm, interesting. Right? So it's a linear momentum of particle alpha. You see it's a p small. There is no bar underneath. It's a p small. Linear momentum of single particle alpha. Right? Okay, it's interesting. It's getting interesting. All right, so summation p alpha. And of course, all that, if we add all linear momentum of all particles, of course, we're not, we're going to end up with the total linear momentum of the system. Now it's a P capital. There is a bar underneath, right? Okay, so now we're getting that, huh? Okay, let me write one more time. So it's a P capital divided by the total mass of the system. And now it looks, okay, let me rewrite it one more time. So uh, total linear momentum of the system equals M times R dot. And now I will frame it and I can say, wow, it's amazing. It's a really uh, amazing, right? Why? Because basically we are dealing with the multi-particle system. And let's say for whatever reasons, I know, uh, your minor compulsion. You want to know what's the total linear momentum of the system, of the whole system. Let's say it consists of 100 particles. Of course, brute force, if you want to do it straightforward, you need to basically chase every particle, interview it. So what's your linear momentum? I mean, what's your velocity? What's your mass, right? Uh, calculate linear momentum, then uh, chase another particle, then that particle, right, in order to get the whole picture. So basically, you need to chase each particle. You need to get information about each particle in order to get the total linear momentum. But once now we introduce the center of mass point, and if you want to know the total linear momentum, you just, you need to chase only one point, center of mass point, and create basically a fake particle, fake particle with the total mass of the system, position at the center of mass, and once you know the velocity of the center of mass, you can tell immediately the total linear momentum of the system. It's tremendous simplification when you deal with multi-particle system. It's a huge, it's a huge, it's a first huge thing, right? But of course now you see we're dealing with some kind of fake particles every time. Right? So the total mass of the system position at the center of mass. And once you know velocity of the center of mass, you can tell, okay, I know the total linear momentum of the system. It's amazing. Right. All right. So basically, uh, it allows It allows us to find easily uh, the total linear momentum of the system. Okay, P capital, right. And, and uh, okay, it's a, after first derivative, we got this amazing property. Now, let's look at, um, let's differentiate it one more time with respect to time. Let's look what happens. Uh, in the lower level, at the lower level, let's look at, uh, let's look deeper. Okay, here it's the first bullet, now the second bullet, right, so. Right, differentiate one more time, so. Okay, let's look deeper. Okay, so it will be, of course, which way I wrote it? Yeah, just this way. So P dot equals to M R double dot. Okay, now we have to make an assumption, of course, right? Uh, because when I introduced, I actually, I don't remember, I erased, I think I wrote it down. I think I wrote uh, over here at the very beginning. I think underneath I wrote, uh, that our reference frame was inertial. I think, yes, I did, I, I did, I did write, that, write that down, right? So in this case, we don't have to make that assumption because it was done at the very beginning when we were introducing uh, the center of mass point. So if that reference frame is inertial, we can use that 
Newton's second law adopted for a multi-particle system because again I remember Newton's second law is written was written for a point mass and then we adopted it for a multi-particle system where all internal forces was washed out were washed out all right so now uh, we can write also okay we can put so p dot equals to f net external force acting on the system so I will just use Newton's second law adopted for a multi-particle system. And as a result, we're getting that uh, m r double dot equals to external net external force acting on the system. And we're getting the second amazing property. Okay, now again, there is some fake particle with total mass m position at the center of mass. And all external forces are exerted, net external force is exerted on, the, uh, on that particle. And, and so what's, the ama what's amazing about this? We want to do what? We want to describe uh, dynamics of the system. We, we, you remember, we want to be like a fortune teller. We want to predict the future of the system. We want to describe the motion of the multi-particle multi system. We want to know its position, velocity, blah, 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 at any moment of time later. And uh, this allows us to get at least some information about the motion of the system. We want to get at least uh, some predictions of the, not completely, not complete description of the motion, but some of that. Basically, it, if you solve this equation, you will be able to describe motion of the center of mass point of the system. Basically, you can get the trajectory of the center of mass point. And how do we call that motion in physics? Motion of the center of mass. Again, as I said, it's, it, will, it will not be a, a complete description of the motion, but it will be part of the motion. So how do we call this motion of the center of mass? If I solve this equation, I will get some trajectory and I can say, okay, and that will be uh, some description of the motion of the system. Basically, this is a definition of translational motion. It's a translational motion. When you solve this equation, you will be able to describe motion of the system partially you will be able to get only translational motion. Of course, you will not be able to describe position of the uh, orientation of position, orientation of the system, okay. well, relative to some point, and of course that will be relative to the center of mass. But at least we will be able to get translational motion, some motion, some uh, part, of the, uh, part of the description, right? So basically now what you do, instead of your multiparticle system, you find the center of mass, we have definition, we have tricks, right? So you find the center of mass, create a fake particle with the total mass over there. Or you can say, you can just squeeze the whole system at the center of mass. Apply net external force, just basically collect all the external forces. Apply to that point. Solve this equation, which is basically like a fake Newton's second law for a particle, for a fake particle R, M. You should be able to solve it, get a trajectory, and that trajectory is a trajectory of the center of mass, which is the translational motion of the uh, multiparticle system. So you see, it it's, it's immediately gives us, uh, yeah, part of the description. It's a tremendous simplification. Right. But of course, as I said, it's not a complete motion, right? Um, it's a part of the motion. So this allows us to describe translational motion of the system. So, center of mass, um, it's a gift from God, right? <laughs> uh, which simplifies uh, description, right? And of course, that's why uh, everything is about the center of mass all the time, right? Translational motion of the center of mass, then rotational motion about the center of mass. Right? Okay, so now... That's, these are two amazing things. Okay, then next class I will sort of uh, uh, write down this second amazing features, right? And, uh, and then we'll, we'll continue from here. Uh, and from here, what, we'll, what will be left? As I said, this is going to, no, this gives us translational motion. And of course, next step, can we describe somehow orientation of the system, right? Of course, we're going to describe, we're going to 
try to find a way of describing uh, rotational motion of the system. Right. Okay, so basically we, um, we've come to the point where we will introduce now angular momentum, uh, torques, right, rotational Newton's second law, because now we have everything that we need to know to describe translational motion, but not rotational. <laughs> okay, so that's what I was planning to discuss today, right, and uh, now, uh, yeah, I, I hold it you longer, right? in order to sort of finish the second amazing feature, and then, of course, I will sum them up in the next class. Thank you.